everyone and welcome to Conversations Around the Piano. I'm Eleanor Weinman and I'm really, really excited to finally get a chance to talk to Frances Wilson, who is a very well-known British pianist, teacher and blogger and is very much with me as far as our concern and care for the world of the amateur piano. Mm -hmm. So Frances, welcome. And it's so great to finally be able to have this conversation with you, which is long, long overdue. Um, thank you, Eleanor. I'm delighted to be here. My personal experience with um, amateur pianists has been teaching them for more decades than I'd like to admit. And um, as I grow older, I, and as I um, try to work on my leisurely skills, you know, I like to take dance lessons or, you know, photography, mm -hmm. uh, I'm beginning to appreciate how important it is to find something um, in your life that you enjoy and that you do non-professionally and, mm -hmm. and how much it relaxes you and bright, it broadens your, your horizons and your perception of yourself as a person. Mm -hmm. And um, in the past decade or so, I've really been thinking about the fact that uh, the classical music world doesn't really pay so much attention to the importance uh, of the amateur pianist, to the, to the, first of all, the sheer numbers, I'm sure are mind boggling because mm -hmm. you know, let's face it, we have more pianos in our house than we have violins um, or any other instrument really, I would venture to guess. And um, these people who are, they're the buyers of the recordings, they're the listeners, they're the audience of our concert halls, um, they're our students, it's really important to address their needs. We all address the needs of children in the classical mm -hmm. world. But I think, you know, childhood only lasts, what, 10, 15 years, but amateur pianists have a long, long way ahead of them. So, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about that. Great, I'm very happy to do that. It's one of my great passions. I mean, I, I am a advanced amateur pianist. Um, I think I've only been paid for three performances in my entire playing career so I don't really regard myself as a professional or even a semi-professional um, but what I find so wonderful about the world of the amateur pianist is, is the passion and commitment that one encounters from people of all ages um, and I think that um, it, it sits with very well with the, the original French definition of amateur which is someone who loves and, and the, the love and affection for, which amateurs display towards their music and the instrument is actually, actually extraordinary and constantly inspiring. I'm so happy that you actually mentioned the provenance of the word because um, I was thinking about that. And uh, personally, uh, when I hear the word amateur, what comes to mind is someone who is you know, not so good at something. Mm. It's just one of those default cultural things. And, yeah. and let's go back to the roots and, and remember what it actually means. It's, it's a lover of something. Yeah, and I, I think that's really important because I think too often people have this idea that if you're an amateur at, at anything, it means that you're a hobbyist or, or I mean, that there's an expression, Sunday painter or Sunday pianists, you know, someone who does it on a Sunday at the weekend and perhaps they don't do it very well. And certainly my ex my own personal experience, my playing and that of people I know in the amateur piano world is that just isn't true. Um, as I said, it's, the passion and commitment of these people is absolutely remarkable. We both, I think, have taught um, quite a few amateur adults as well and teaching adults. So... Um, I was wondering um, what your experience has been, if you'd like to talk about that. Um, I've, yes, I've taught a few adults and um, I actually really like teaching adults. I, I, I think it might be to do with the fact that I perhaps have quite a good understanding of, of the experience. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons why I decided to start taking lessons again myself um, that was in 2008. So I'd been teaching for two years and a, an adult, um, almost beginner student came to me and she was a very confident woman who ran her own business. Um, but you got her on the piano stool and she turned into this quivering mass of anxiety and tension. 
And so I thought the only way that I would be able to understand how she felt would be to put myself in her place. Um, and I started having lessons with a former concert pianist and um, master teacher at one of the London conservatoires who taught privately. And it gave me a way into the psychology of being a, a student as an adult. Um, and I, I think te teaching adults is so different to teaching children. It really is. I think it takes a completely, almost completely different skill set. Um, and adults often have very high expectations. Oh, yeah. um, I remember a student, he only came to me twice, um, but he was a London taxi driver. And he stepped into my piano room and announced that one day he would play Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. Oh, my goodness. Um, and when he actually came to play, um, there was an awful lot of work that was going to need to be done. But I thought his his dedication and, and his 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 sort of desire to 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 tackle this you know great piece from the repertoire was really admirable so i think one has all the time with adults is manage their expectations so you want to encourage and support them while also being realistic about what's possible um so i i've always tried to be very positive um and to you know guide them in in the kind of repertoire that they might like to tackle um, without dampening their enthusiasm, because I think once the enthusiasm goes, then you've lost the student and they'll never come back. And people can, I mean, I've seen people who've been damaged by teachers who take a very negative attitude, who who kind of have lost the spirit and the will. And I think that's really sad. Um, the other thing that I think adults struggle with is is finding time to practice, because if, if music is not your full time job, um, you've then got to squeeze in the practice time when you come home from work or balance it with your commitments to your family and your home. And actually one of the interesting things that's happened this year with the lockdowns and the pandemic is that amateur pianists have been, you know, loudly cheering the fact that they've got all this practice time. Um, Cause if one is confined to one's home for, for, for reasons just mentioned, and um, one now works from home, you can find more time to practice. So in the early days of the lockdown, a number of my amateur pianist friends were posting daily videos of what they'd been working on on Facebook, which was um, actually very enjoyable. Um, so I think something else that I always try and encourage is, is um, to understand that practicing doesn't have to be done in great long swathes of time. Um, and I, I, I like to remind people that actually professional pianists do not spend eight hours in a practice room. I think it's a myth. Um, I like to hope it's a myth because I think that the thought of that amount of time is not good. Um, that amount of time just spent doing that one activity, not good for your physical and mental health. And actually there comes a point, I suppose about three or four hours in where you're not really practicing productively. Um, so I, I think, it helps to remind amateurs that, that professional pianists don't spend their entire lives locked to their instrument practicing and that they do actually have a life outside of the practice room and that, that one can organise one's practice time to be productive. And actually, you can do a lot in 10 minutes if that's all you've got, so long as you know what to practice. Um, and again, I think that's that's a very important aspect of being a teacher, whether of adults or children, in fact, is is showing the student how to practice productively and intelligently um, and that kind of guidance I think is really invaluable and it can actually then set the student on a path to a lot more independent work and independent learning which I think also builds confidence. You know as I'm listening to you and um, hearing your your takes on so many rich subjects I kind of I keep wanting to interrupt and say <laughs> Yes, and this is what happened to me. Yes, and totally. So, um, you know, we're either going to have to edit this down or, or, <laughs> or have another talk, but I'm going to try to briefly address because these are all extremely important um, and worthwhile discussions, topics. So, um, first of all, I love teaching adults um, because, as you said, it's a different skill set and um, you know, with children, I don't want to say you want to come down to their level, but um, 
conceptually they cannot grasp as much and yeah. they're not really interested which yeah true be. um when i teach an adult the great i feel that you know i'm not overqualified one thing i wanted to slightly um direct people's attention to as far as how much professional people will practice it's you're absolutely right professional musicians don't practice that many hours <clears throat> unless unless maybe they need to learn a new piece um, mm. but what prof musicians who end up being professionals they spend a hell of a lot of time practicing in their teens mm. so if you're talking about somebody who's been professionally trained um, you know, you start usually when you're four, five, six, right? Mm -hmm. Seven, eight. I mean, you know, people talk about Richter having a late start in life because uh, he was he came to, you know, the Moscow Conservatory at the age of 21 or so. But yeah. but Richter, you know, he he played at home. He studied. Sure, opera. sure. It's it's not like he never touched the piano. Plus, yeah, the piano culture in, in the family. Mo most people who are in conservatories practice, you know four or five hours a day as children. Mm. And then in the teens, if you're really seriously preparing, that's when you learn most of your repertoire. Mm -hmm. you learn the concerti, you learn the Beethoven sonatas, the, the Chopin etudes, the list, because these are the war horses of the competition mm. that you are participating and will go to. So, but of course, you know, when I was in my teens, I there were days when I practiced eight, 10 hours a day when mm. I was getting ready for a competition. And um, obviously that changes, but I think those years, uh, roughly the second decade of your life, is really what amateur pianists um, cannot, unfortunately, ever catch up to. It's yeah. not possible. That yeah, happens. I agree. And because of that, uh, they sometimes, as far as the choice of repertoire, as you said, um, they're all the pieces that we love, and everybody wants to play the pathetic, and, and the mm. page sounds wonderful. Mm. but. Professional pianists have that training that will help them get through the most difficult, the one measure in that sonata that's really difficult for an amateur mm -hmm. or a certain section. And, and that is the, this kind of a divide, which mm -hmm. unfortunately is there, that the early training and the quality of training and, you know, not only do professionals practice a lot, but they have the best quality training. Yeah. And, which is difficult to assess um, if you're not a professional. You know, I, I, you know, I have to deal with a plumber. How do I know who's a good plumber? And yes. my, I, um, I apologize for such a simplistic analogy, but um, <laughs> I know a, a lot of people who don't know how to choose a good piano teacher. Yeah. No, I, I think the right teacher is is really important. I mean, I was very lucky as a teenager to have a teacher who pushed me. Um, and encouraged me to do a lot of self-learning. Um, and I'm also an only child and I'm quite independent in that respect. And I like the challenge of um, kind of teaching myself. And then when I returned to the piano as an adult, I've actually studied with um, two professional pianists and taken mentoring from several others, um, which has made a big difference. And I, I agree with everything you've said about the professional musicians training, but I think that amateurs also can learn a great deal from um, interacting and studying with, um, you know, concert pianists, pianists who are also very good teachers, um, because we they, they help us gain a certain skill set, which perhaps a teacher who hasn't had that experience is not able to give um, and that it goes back to the the idea of intelligent practicing i think this is a wonderful point as far as taking lessons from an actual professional uh, experienced pianist mm. as, as you could learn something different from everyone but i wanted yeah. to point out one very important thing um which is going into specifics but i think it will be helpful fingerings Fing mm -hmm is absolutely it, it's a vast topic and i think no matter how many articles we read you will not cover fingerings but mm -hmm. one thing that always happens is that even in editions of music editors of music are not professional pianists who play yep. up tempo and 
if there's one thing, the fingering revelations you could get from someone who can actually play the piece up mm. are mm. sometimes diametrically opposite of what you're doing at a slow tempo. And it's just, yeah. it can be such a, such a uh, drawback to not having a perspective of um, being up to speed. I, I, I agree very much with that. Um, and in fact, the first teacher I went to as an adult had studied amongst other people with Peter Voigtwanger, who's famous for his um, unusual fingerings for scales. Um, and that was a real revelation. She's actually written a whole book about alternative fingerings for scales and arpeggios, which um, are incredibly helpful you know, within the context of actual pieces. And I, I, going back to the idea of the fingerings that are included in additions, I mean, this this is something that a, a lot of amateurs sort of of the early stages and intermediate rather than the more advanced players really, I think, struggle with because they have this idea that if it's written in the book, it must be the right fingering. They have different shaped hands and different fingers. You know, there is no one size fits all. I mean, that's true of teaching in general, but I think specifically with regard to fingering, and that a lot of that is is a process of experimentation and finding what works. Um, yes. And I think that a lot of amateurs struggle with this idea of kind of stepping away from a, a perceived right way. And um, this is something that I'm very interested in in general in in music and specifically in piano playing. That there isn't a right way and that we should find an individual way that works for us. And like you say, I think a professional pianist who appreciates these things and understands them very deeply can offer incredibly helpful advice. I mean, I the second teacher I went to when I was working for my final diploma, um, we were working on, I think, a piece by Bach. And he told me that the fingerings he was giving me had come to him from Andras Schiff. And that seemed really special. It was like being given a gift. Um, and that's something else. I think this idea that, that great teachers like that pass down wisdom through their students who then pass it on to the next generation. And, and that's actually really wonderful as well as being incredibly helpful to, to have had that. Um, and yeah, th those kinds of things are really special. And um, it's not, you don't get that from every teacher. Not at all. That's true. Um, and um, on the other side of the spectrum there, what you mentioned before, I'd like to bring back um, as far as experimenting and remembering that nothing is written in stone. Actually, there can be quite a few mistakes in the edition that maybe yes. the editor, and I learned that after my first transcription of Night on Bold Mountain was published, that no matter how much, how vigilant I am, things will creep through. It's yeah. just, you know, there's a chain of, uh, from me through the printer and, and things happen. Mm. But what I wanted, and, and that's important, that's actually something that a lot of my adult students don't realize. Mm. That that even in this book, there could be an it's, error, you know, there could be. Yeah, a, yeah. Um, but this idea of experimenting, what if, if you don't like the finger, if it doesn't fit you, or if you're just curious, maybe there's another yeah. possible fingering. I find that most of my students are hesitant. It, it, mm. It's a matter of some kind of a confidence, I guess. And I think it's definitely confidence, yeah. And, and I find that confidence can only come from experimenting and the exercise of practicing, mm -hmm. really think about pencil in and the next day rework a fingering. And there's no yeah. substitute for that. So yeah, I agree. I think, um, fingerings passed down from masters are fantastic yeah um, but if you're sitting at and there's no fingering in a particular spot instead of asking you know looking whom can i ask um mm. you should just practice um trying for your own fingerings and, and one very important idea about fingerings which i think also uh, is not addressed very often is that um most um, most of us um, don't really experiment with our hand position when we mm. experiment with the fingering. So you, of course, know that if you're, for example, playing a, a WC piece, your hand is like in a completely different world than mm. if you're playing a Mozart sonata or a Bach piece. So um, 
when we're looking for uh, or trying maybe a, a different fingering, it could be yeah. more comfortable and doable if we just, I mean, I, I kind of, I feel like I need to um, do a little bit of this, but um, your hand, let me just get, yes, all right. So um, if your hand is in this position, a completely different fingering can be experienced. Mm -hmm. You know, you could trill yeah. with different fingers, and so I think that's um, a very important concept um, mm -hmm. to spell out to amateurs. It, it, yeah, that I don't really see addressed um, in social media or maybe books. You know, I find that um, it's really difficult to take in a lot of information at once when you're taking a lesson, if you're reading an article about mm -hmm. finger. So. Um, you actually have made some really, really interesting and helpful videos uh, for Piano Magazine. That oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, very valuable. And the mm. nice thing is that they're short. Yes. Because a person is going to look at something, and of course, nowadays, we all have our guidelines about how long a video is, and we all know that most of our viewers only watch, you know, a few seconds of our videos. <laughs> I mean, they mm -hmm. watch all of them, but it's just a different length requirement. But um, I also have some practice tips on my website, and I try to focus on one or two just mm. specific ideas because I find that it's easier for people to remember one this day. It's not necessary to learn everything about fingering at once, nor is it possible. Yeah. There are certain concepts which, you know, over the years, I just I could predict that 95% of adult amateurs that I see are going to do the same thing when I go. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just because there's um, some common challenges that we all face, but the yes, world true. of pianism, there's a huge, vast amount of repertoire, and every composer demands um, his or her own set of, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. touch, of interpretation, of approach. So it's really impossible to um, learn a lot in one day. And um, there's actually one thing that I really, uh, the only thing I really wanted to demonstrate for this video, and it has to do with the uh, sitting position. Mm. Indulge me for a second, right? Because mm. I've always seen all kinds of instruction as to how high you sit, and I still feel that most people sit too low. Yes. But I'm going to move the camera a little bit um, to illustrate something that, again, with my students, I find is, uh, my head is cut off, but it doesn't matter. Um, I find that most people who come to me sit like this. Right? Yes. So me too close. Too close to the piano. Yeah. But but instinctively, uh, their body feels better. So when I tell them, you know what? Why don't you try to just move the chair mm. so there's less of you, and and they're like, oh, that's not really comfortable, or I feel <laughs> so far away, and they're actually sometimes not even willing. To do this, and sometimes if I if I'm dealing with a person that I don't want to you know push away, I don't insist. But it's so important to understand that first of all, your elbow, if you're playing scales in four octaves, which you should, as opposed to two, right? Mm -hmm. um, your elbows can pass, and it's very important to free up your arms, and then the distribution of weight, not to mention the back. Mm -hmm and some people have issues with their back. If you're sitting like this, then your back automatically, your weight is yeah. the way, so you can't use any of your natural body weight to be able to elicit, you know, really great chord. So you're sitting there and you're trying to push, mm -hmm. it gets back, and I'm gonna stop now, because, you know. <laughs> I just feel so strongly about it because there hasn't been one student that didn't come to me and wasn't sitting. Yeah. Their best advantage. And when you sit like this and really your weight is on your feet, mm. you can move your torso and really yeah. direct your body weight and get a natural sound that, you know, it's not too mm. So thank you for <laughs> sitting through this. But I just, um, you know, I think um, both of us, both of us are partially doing this because we really, um, we're we want to help amateurs mm. oh definitely I, I just, um, yeah what you said about posture i think is really important um so the the first teacher i went to as an adult one of her specialities is tension-free playing and i actually went to her because i had tendonitis 
which yeah. had come about from playing octaves in some late Schubert too fast. And I had I realised when I went to her that although I had a good teacher in my teens, I hadn't really been taught technique properly. I mean, I, I had the, a kind of basic technique that enabled me to get around the repertoire that I was playing at that time. But she, this this woman gave me so much more. And this this understanding of, of the body, not just the fingers and the hands, but, but yeah. the whole body. And you're saying about where, how you sit um, and with the feet firmly planted on the ground. Her um, metaphor, which I really liked, was, was of a tree that's firmly rooted, but the top part of it can sway and move very freely. And um, beautiful, that's a beautiful. It's a, she's she's very good at those kinds. That she had some wonderful metaphors which I used in my own teaching. They translated very well to to teaching children and adults. People really responded to them. But um, I realized very quickly as well that 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 playing like that gave one not only the ability to get around the keyboard much more easily and efficiently, but it actually had an impact on the sound, and that was really really important and you're saying about you know we adapt to different composers and repertoire you mentioned Debussy in particular um, and I was working on some Debussy with her at that time and just a change in posture a change in arm weight and kind of a change in the mental attitude to how one sits at the instrument brought about an instant change in the sound I was making. And from that moment, I realized that you know, this, this was so important. Um, and, yeah. and it's yeah. very noticeable when you, when you listen, that's something else actually we should mention is that not all pianists listen to themselves. So you can, you know, actually hearing those changes and, and that the, a small adjustment in the hand weight or arm weight or the angle of the elbow, um, your your upper body posture can make such a difference um and you know i i'm so grateful that i was able to study with her for i think six nearly six years mm. um it it was transforming and she helped me manage tendonitis which is yeah. very very important actually because i've never had any problems with it since then i i again you said something that brings up at least three subjects that are <laughs> of utmost importance. Um, and I also had tendonitis, except for me, it was funeral by list. Those oh gosh, yes. <laughs> octaves, you know, just by nature are difficult. And, mm -hmm. But, you know, I won't go into them now. But this wonderful idea of this aha moment with a, with a team mm. and, and the use of analogy, the tree metaphor, Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I was thinking about extensively before our talk, because I also have, in my experience, these moments, because I've had my main teachers, but what you do, um, and I think what most amateurs should do, is you should play for somebody new, just to play yes. once, and to get their take on things. Mm -hmm. and various pianists, as I was, you know, kind of coming up uh, to the... Uh, competition circus my teacher would take me to this person and that mm -hmm. letters recommendations so on and they all want to help because they're all musicians yes. and usually that's what I remember throughout my history as a student it, everybody has something to say that you will not hear from mm. anyone else and uh, just just recently I was um, in preparation for my cello suites um, recording I was listening I was looking at some YouTube videos of the Russian cellist Mstislav Rostropovich, mm -hmm. who recorded them and at a late stage in his life. Mm -hmm. But he has these very short, maybe 10, 15 minutes each talks on the, mm -hmm. the cello suites. And this was after I already recorded, but I still want to learn about them. And these were yeah. new videos to me. And um, he was talking about, um, I forget which suite it was, at number three. And he was talking about Bach's use of the pedal point and how powerful and and long it gets and how Bach is insistent. It really struck me of a lepidopterist thinning down on butterfly. Yes. He talked about how, you know, and the butterfly is trying to get away, <laughs> pinned down. And this reminded me of, um, you know, how a, a teacher will use a story yeah. or, or an analogy. And uh, when you're talking about Andra Schiff, uh, Schiff, I saw an interview with Andra Schiff where he was talking about 
um, how you need to be prepared and know what you want to say as a pianist, to mm. know what your statement will be, your interpretation. And he said, you can't, when you get out on stage, you, you can't be a walking question mark. It's wonderful, these, these types of teachers who, who say things that convey the idea in, in a poetic way. You know, yes. Music is poetry and Debussy is a different landscape. Mm. And, you know, I don't know, Chopin. Um, so it's really important to learn from different people. Uh, I think, right. yeah, I, I think that's a very, very good point. In fact, I think we had a, a brief discussion about this on Twitter the other week, didn't we? Um, I mean, I, I've played to quite a number of people um, and each person, I, you know, you, you may not necessarily agree with what that person has said to you, but I think everybody has something of value to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can kind of take take away those comments and feedback and mull them over when you're practicing. Um, I know that some students are very keen to play to other teachers other than their regular teacher, which is why many of them go on piano courses. Um, and lots of my amateur pianist friends are absolutely addicted to piano courses. And again, it's it's partly to do with the sense of community, but it's an opportunity to play your repertoire to other teachers and some of the piano courses have an amazing faculty of international artists who who are also conservative conservatoire teachers so you're you're having access to really fine fine musicians and fine minds and fine teachers um i think there's there's a a potential difficulty there in that one can have too much information and it can be confusing and um, <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, it can also be conflicting. And I think yes. that is a source of a lot of people's hesitancy to approach somebody else. Because yes. in the moment of receiving a piece of information that may seem conflicting, there's this, oh, I don't want to deal with this. This person yeah. is this. But it's, it usually takes time to digest. One yes. Topic, and then maybe when you're better, there's something opposite or seemingly so that mm -hmm. the same teacher would tell you to do. I, no, I, I think that's very true. Yeah. Um, but I, I also think that as one gains confidence as, as a pianist, um, and we've talked briefly as, uh, earlier about confidence and amateur pianists, you know, as one becomes more confident, you're able to filter out the, the information that's useful and going to be helpful to you and, and reject the rest of it. You know, I think a lot of less confident amateurs have this idea that whoever the teacher is, they must be telling them the right thing and they must act on it. Um, I, was at some, I was at one of the most famous UK piano summer schools a couple of years ago as, as a journalist, not as a participant. And I remember going into the canteen for supper and this chap came up to me and he said, I've been given five different ways to play this part of the Schubert Klavierstück. Um, by five different teachers, and I don't know what to do. And I thought that kind of summed up for me that that he perhaps didn't have the confidence or the musical maturity to say, I'm going to go with this person's suggestion because I like that, or this person's, or I'm going to take a little bit from everybody and then make it my own. Um, so it can can be very conflicting but but I think in general I think it's a very very positive and very useful experience um yes this, and, yeah it's, and, and it's I very very helpful piano um the setting in which you're talking about I can totally understand somebody uh, if that's not an exaggeration it must be really um very disorienting <laughs> especially if you don't yet have your own established interpretation mm -hmm. uh, because of course you know I, I always I was always somebody who eschewed listening to records of other people until I really felt strongly about how to play the piece because mm -hmm. then when I heard Horowitz or when I heard Schiff I could enjoy some of the details um, but I didn't feel swayed or, or mm -hmm. confused by their interpretation so I can certainly see how listening to several master classes on the same piece can be overwhelming um, yes but i i think um to in, in a more practical way um people of course it's very important to have a relationship with your teacher and mm. i think more often than not 
um, a huge factor in um, the teacher we choose is the personal interaction, the mm. relationship, the chemistry as a person. Um, you know, it's almost like a marriage. What, you know, what were your parents like and what are you mm. looking for yeah. from a teacher? So there's that aspect. And there's also the friendship that develops, the kinship and mm. collaboration. And it's really difficult to even think about not looking elsewhere, but just getting getting a little bit of a perspective for someone mm. just once, maybe. Mm. Um, because uh, we're all humans, and as much as I hate to admit it, with my own students, and I, I don't teach regularly anymore, I just, you know, I do offer consultations, and mm. I, it used to be via Zoom, but now everything is via Zoom. But um, when I used to teach regularly, I absolutely fell into this habitual mode with every student and once in a while if it was a child the parent would call me and say oh are we going to do the harmonic scales and i'd be like <laughs> of course we should be doing that but we just had a recital and we were focused on the pieces and i forgot mm -hmm. or an adult you know an adult really wants to play chopin all the time and mm -hmm. i don't want to ruin our relationship but you know chopin is not my favorite composer to teach and you know <laughs> covers up to many sins and you really mm. should be doing Haydn and Mozart. Um, but, you know, if, if they heard it from somebody else once, it would have, um, you know, more of an effect than from me. So I mm. always encouraged my students to go and play for somebody else. But oh, yeah. perhaps, perhaps there are teachers who are not as open to that um, for whatever reasons. I don't know. Um, but um, hopefully everybody has the freedom to um, experiment and, and also these mm. You can watch a video. Yes, there's so much online. I, I think some adult amateurs have an idea that once they've settled with a particular teacher, they have to stay with that teacher, you know, for years and years. And the, the teacher will be offended if they, they go and seek endorsement or feedback from somebody else, whether it is, you know, a one off consultation or in a masterclass or on a course. And I, I think that actually says more about the personality of the teacher than it does about the student. Um, I mean, I'm, I've always been worried about teachers that seem to cling to their students and won't let them go. Um, and there is a time, you know, as a teacher when students and teachers outgrow one another, you know, and, and to me, I think one of the one, most wonderful things is when a student says, you know, I, I don't really feel I need to have any lessons anymore. I want to go and do it, do it on my own or, or, you know, move up to a, a, a much more experienced teacher than I. Um, and I, I think it's important to, to allow them that freedom. Um, and I, I think, again, it does boil down to confidence that some just feel they, they, they're afraid of the unknown almost. They don't want to let go. I've just written a blog article about letting go, actually, oh. um, with regard to various aspects, including this one. Well, um, Speaking of your blog, I know that it's extremely well known, and you have a uh, you know, many thousands, uh, twenty thousands followers. Um, and um, wasn't it also recognized by the Library of Congress? Help me. What? what, what oh, the, the the British Library. Yes. Sorry, yes. I'm, I'm American, so. You know, no, it's the same same idea. <laughs> <laughs> well. The equivalent. So. Yeah. I mean, belated congratulations. On oh, that. thank you. Really and you do cover so many articles so intelligently. And if I, if you don't mind my adding, they're not excessively long because you know I, I get the idea and there's the gist and and it's really sometimes unnecessary to have exhaustive articles in the subject. Yeah. So. Well, but, well, the blog grew out of my return to the piano, um, and initially it was a, almost like a practice diary. I just thought rather than write it in a notebook, I'd write it in a blog. Um, so, you know, the uh, many of the early articles on it are about my own experiments and explorations as a returning pianist. You know, the, the pleasures and the frustrations, the challenges, and also the experience of being taught again, um, which is, you know, going back as a mature person in my early 40s was um, a remarkable experience as I've already explained about that particular teacher and subsequent teachers that I've encountered um so so it it kind of just developed from there um and I've always wanted it to be a resource for 
people like me in part and in fact um there are certain changes happening with it over the next few months um all my meet the artist interviews for example are going to be hosted on their own separate site and i decided to to shift the focus back back more to articles about you know various aspects of being a pianist i'm very interested in the, in the psychology of being a pianist i talked earlier about the loneliness or the solitariness i don't consider myself lonely when i'm playing the piano because the piano is the companion um, and I like the solitariness of it. Not only is the piano the companion, but you're in the company of the greatest, usually, composers that ever yeah. have been, and you're communing with their musical thoughts. So yeah. that's a, 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 you know, that's a bonus. I, I agree. I think it's an extraordinary, rich and wonderful thing to have, ac to have access. And, you know, now with, with so much music available online, um, we we're we're absolutely spoiled for choice, and then there are people that are creating new music for pianists and, and other instrumentalists, of course, all the time. So we, yeah, we have a, an incredible resource, and and you know, one doesn't have to stick with the core canon either. You know, you can, pl you know, I I play whatever interests me now because I'm not yeah. having regular <clears throat> lessons. Um, I pick repertoire not because I think it will be good for me or because a teacher says I must learn it you know and that's again that's something else that I think adults can enjoy you don't have to learn things just because they might be good for you um <laughs> you can learn music because I only play what I like to play and do what I like yeah. to do these days I, I learned that it's actually possible yeah I agree and um you know when you when you realize that that you you know you don't have to do your journey exercises and and your hand and and you know you don't have to learn a set number of Chopin etudes to be a you know a proper pianist um it, it's very liberating so i i have quite strange and varied tastes um schubert is my great love i've loved schubert's piano music since i was about 12 um and um you know, I go back to his music, not that regularly, but when I do, I feel like I've gone home again. Um, but I'm I'm learning some Ravel at the moment, uh, a composer who's eluded me for years because I thought that he and I just didn't get on. Um, and actually going back to our conversation about fingering, I've learned an awful lot about fingering and hand and finger position and shape of the hand and playing Ravel. It's fiddly fiddly music but it's very rewarding um and i'm really enjoying that so yeah I, I think you know we should play what we like what gives us pleasure what what um satisfies us and interests us because you know again for the for the amateur it's all about the love um and um if you're if you're not loving what you're play, playing you know i sort of think why, why are you doing it you know it shouldn't be a chore it should be enjoyable
feel that I have an affinity. Uh, I'm more confident playing some composers mm. more than others. And I'm also drawn to some composers, as you are to Schubert, yes. for example, you know, for the romantic canon, I'm drawn to Rachmaninoff and mm -hmm. to Brahms a lot more than I am to Chopin mm. or Schubert. And, but mm -hmm. it's just a personal, there's something that resonates in me when I'm playing, I'm hearing <clears throat> those two composers that I just feel fulfills whatever it is that, that I'm, that my personality is in a sense. Mm. Of course, lately I've been working a lot with Bach. Mm. That's a completely different category altogether. Mm. Um, because he's up, you know, he's kind of a his own category. But mm -hmm. um, back to saying you don't have to do churning exercises, I completely agree with you. <laughs> but I feel absolutely compelled to say that um, if you do a little bit of Bach every day as a warm up, you're going mm -hmm. to be in just as good a shape. But um, yeah, that satisfies two very important, um, you know, the spirit and your fingers because you do we do as amateur semi-professional as teachers we have to keep our fingers in shape mm. and um chopin um schubert i believe and i know i'm generalizing but we all have our opinions schubert will keep your fingers in better shape than chopin unless you're talking playing the etudes of chopin mm. most of us are not talking about but it's important to uh have something in your repertoire that is exercising your fingers yeah. And yeah, I agree. Muscles and, and and I I really do not think Hannon um, Hannon is literally several hundreds of years ago. It was not mm. written for people today, um, and I think we need to think about that. And it's useful to play it a little bit, but mm. people to play him for hours and to play all the exercises through. And um, I think any you know Bach invention, even if hand separately, is going to mm. do good. Scales, on the other hand, I believe are important for the yes. of the structure of, uh, you know, the Western European major minor system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. For also recognition and analysis in the pieces that we play. Yes. I think that's one thing that also a lot of adult students consider a revelation when, um, when a teacher talks to them about structure analysis and looking at the piece without mm -hmm. playing just to understand what the language is, I think, um, and this is getting back to what we were planning to talk about, which is what can you do in a short period of time? Mm. How do you practice efficiently? Um, you talk also in that video that I mentioned, uh, the Piano Magazine YouTube video about recording yourself, mm -hmm. which is extremely important. Mm. And, uh, I myself have been guilty of not doing it enough. And it's amazing how much you can hear when you just have a perspective on what you're doing instead yeah. of being at the piano and being involved with the logistics. Uh, you mm. Hear yourself, as you were saying, it's very important to hear yourself. In order for you to be able to hear yourself, the mechanics have to be at a certain level that you're not mm. worried about them. So in addition to the recording aspect of, if I have five, 10 minutes today and I feel guilty about not having practiced, what can I do to help me along? A lot more helpful than practicing for five, 10 minutes can be either recording as we talk yeah. about, or looking at the piece, looking at your music and you mm. could be in the tube, in the subway, yes. maybe not these days with COVID, but you could be sitting on your sofa with a cup mm -hmm. of coffee um, mm. and looking and, and as much as to some of us, it's second nature. I think not everyone really spends time understanding wait a minute, this is a pattern and this is yeah. a scale. And here he's repeating the scale again. And, and especially with Bach and with Beethoven, with the classical you know, Baroque composers, it's mm. just mind boggling to see how much they can make out of a couple of patterns. Yes. They yeah. And it's, I can't tell you how many times I sat, I said, okay, today we're just going to look at this invention, you know, number mm -hmm. eight, F major. I remember that one. <laughs> but but you you know when people see oh my goodness and then it happens in the left hand they usually see that mm -hmm. then to show them that the entire piece is just an inversion inside mm -hmm. out upside down of the same two patterns 
the joy of discovery that people experience by mm -hmm. understanding the language of yes. the is amazing. Yeah. And really, all you have to do is look at the music and recognize yeah. the patterns. And that is so, more helpful than 10 hours of practice. In this oh, I, I absolutely agree. And it, it's something that I've observed over the years. I taught for 12 years before I left London. And, and what you've just described is something I used to do as routinely with students when we were embarking on new pieces. So most, you put a new piece in front of a student and most will want to be playing it immediately. They want to get their hands on the keyboard as soon as possible. And I have always, I mean, this is how I learn, is to look first, read, examine. Um, and I think this this idea of looking for patterns, I mean, certainly with children and, and early adult students, it, it's it's a way of almost showing them that the music is not nearly as difficult as it may first appear on the page. And to, to you know, to, to demonstrate that a, a pattern, I mean, the Bach Inventions are fantastic examples. And I actually remember the first time I learned a Bach fugue and I've still got the edition of the Well-Tempered Clavier that I had at the age of, I don't know, nine or 10 with my teacher's diagram of how a Bach fugue worked. And I remember sitting with her and she was showing me the subject and the counter subject. And it, it was one of those wonderful light bulb moments. And it suddenly these this forest of notes on the page turned into this very simple diagram. And I've um, later, when I was studying with my first teacher as an adult, she got me to color code a fugue. I and that, I that was fantastic. It yeah. was such a good tool. I've used that kind of system many times since then. Um, and I, I think so, something else that, that really interests me about piano playing is that a lot of people think it's terribly difficult, but, which it is. Um, and as another teacher of mine used to say, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Um, but um, while, it, yes, it, it, you know, there is some repertoire, a lot of repertoire that is very difficult and very challenging. Um, I think that we even then it's possible to extract it and and sort of boil it down to, to smaller chunks and sections and to simplify it. Usually somebody who's self-taught, for example, really does not have the wherewithal to separate yeah. from. And, and that's a duty of a teacher yes. like yourself or like myself is actually to present a piece that may look daunting because mm. anything looks difficult or at least sure. unknown when we're looking at the page and we don't know the piece and as you were saying to make it simpler even something like just telling a younger student look then it repeats exactly mm. at the end so the piece is really not 32 measures long yes but it's really 16 just yeah. like there's this palpable like tension release yeah okay now i'm ready for it you know yeah it looks scary and um, with uh, adults or with more more difficult pieces, it's exactly the same process mm -hmm. on a large mm -hmm. scale. Um, it's yeah. you know it's our duty to explain and to simplify it mm -hmm. somehow as far as the perception of the piece, which is very important. And absolutely, and I think that those kinds of skills um, are very very useful in sight reading. I mean, it's again something I've observed. You put a piece of a sight reading exercise up on the desk and the student's looking at each individual note and each line. And I'm saying, just look for the patterns, look for the diff repeating shapes, stand back from the music and see literally the bigger picture, the whole page of it. Just backtracking slightly to something you said earlier about um, becoming familiar with what the music looks like on the page. Um, when learning something like Messian, I have a habit of leaving copies or a copy of the score around the house hmm. so that I in somewhere where I might pass regularly on the dining table for example um, so rather than sitting down and studying the music in huge detail at the outset I just like to become familiar with what it looks like on the page and it, its shapes and its peaks and its troughs um, because at, at the moment when it is then taken to the piano it feels much more familiar um, before the sort of really serious note learning begins. And, and again, I, I, I think that adults, some adults have this idea that the music must always be on the music desk for you to be doing your work on it. 
so I, I think the idea that all practicing has to be done at the instrument is is a myth. You know, we can get a lot done, especially memory work as well, a lot done away from the instrument. Um, and also, I think, I think when you remove the keyboard and the hands on the keyboard, your mind is engaged in a slightly different way. There's less um, emphasis on the physicality and more on the cerebral aspects of, of learning the music, if that makes sense. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't think people realize um, that it really takes a lot of repetition to memorize pieces. Mm. Uh, my students come to me and say, well, I can't memorize this, you know, how, and I said, well, how many times do you practice it a day? And a lot of them will say, I, I don't know. <laughs> so so there's this vague uh, idea of memorization, whereas it really takes, you know, I, I, I have my 10 little rocks, of beautiful different rocks, and actually when I learn a new piece, and sometimes I confess it's not very mindful, I just mm. make sure that I repeat everything a certain amount of time yeah. for a certain amount of days. And then I check to see if it's memorized or not. Mm. Mm. I think that's the first step. You have to put in this cut work. Yeah. It, yeah. This, it's a system, isn't it? And a process. Um, and, and again, that, it, I mean, I, I was never taught how to memorize as a child and a teenager. And when I came back to the piano, you know, in my late 30s, I thought, well, actually, I'm I'm not going to, I don't need to. I mean, for me as a concert goer, um, I'm seeing pianists using the score more regularly now and, and quite often with an iPad or a tablet. Um, and I always say that actually, I don't mind how they present the music, whether with the score or without. What I'm interested in is the communication and the sense of connection and imagination and all of that magic that comes from live performance, it's very important to acknowledge that disciplined practice will give you that confidence and freedom to step outside of the kind of confines of the music. So in a performance situation, whether it's playing to your piano club or in a competition or a festival or a public performance, you, you need to have that ability to just step back and set the music free on the day. Um, how you get to that point, and I think we were both having a conversation with someone else on Twitter the other day about this. Again, it's about giving oneself and one's students, if you're, one is teaching, permission to do that, um, which is very, very useful. Um, and it's, it's so esoteric in a way it, and very individual. I can't really explain it, but... Um, well, well, let me try. Maybe, um, let me, I, I'm not claiming to be able to explain it, but um, my personal experience is that I cannot really set myself free if I'm looking at the music. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is personal, but unequivocal. Um, if my eyes are, if I ever play with music, it's usually because I'm not sure whether I have something memorable. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, I'm not talking about chamber music. I'm talking about solo playing. Yeah. Um, you are responsible for communicating and sometimes maybe taking risk, feeling, as you say, free to convey something that maybe you don't convey when you practice. So, uh, whereas I'm not saying that it's a must for mm. any, or any professional because our important duties to ourselves and feeling comfortable and feeling yeah. free in that sense, but in a more narrow definition of communicating and having music in front of you. Um, I think that um, amateurs um, would be well served to experiment and to try to memorize something that is below their ability level yes. just to exercise that muscle. And that yeah. I can't possibly not mention my stepping stones to Bach now, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think it's really important to cultivate that letting go when participating in music making of something that you think is good music, not just because somebody says Bach yes. music or the Schubert impromptu is easier yeah. than Schubert sonata. You know, a lot of amateurs want to play really difficult pieces mm. um, that are just frankly too difficult. And yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I tell my students, listen, I'm fine if you want to play the first page of the Pathetique or 
you know, if uh, some a child wants to play the first page for a lease, if that's what you want to do, um, you're doing it for yourself. Mm. But, but I think there are a lot of people who are who need to start off with things that are frankly easy for them and yes. have that experience and then maybe build up if they want to. Um, you know, but but there's this feeling to be able to really listen to yourself um, is really difficult for me anyway. If I'm if my eyes there, there's a part mm. of the brain that's reading the music that is not engaged. Mm. It's almost like there needs to be engagement of a different portion of yeah the, yeah yeah connect with that creative uh, yeah. spirit which will set you free. No, I I think that's very true. Um, you said about playing easier music. I think that this is another in quite interesting point that comes up a lot with amateurs and I think they get, get to a certain level and it goes back to what we were saying earlier about you know having to play certain you know being feeling one should play certain pieces from the core canon um and I which I fully accept and I you know the core canon is fabulous and there's there's a huge amount to choose from um yes but, um, so something that I do myself and I have encouraged students to do is, is always to have pieces that one plays well or one knows well or are at a certain level lower than one's current repertoire. Because um, on the days when the practicing hasn't gone so well or you're tired or you've had a busy day at work and you, you, know, you, you fit in some time at the piano, it just doesn't work. You need music you can go back to. That kind of restores your confidence and your faith in yourself. I had a student who was obsessed with what grade is this piece? And I, yeah. if, if it was lower than her, you know, the, the grade that she had just passed, she, she didn't want to look at it because she thought it was beneath her, um, which I thought was ridiculous because, again, if it's something that you like playing, um, that's good. It's, you know, you should as we've said so many times in this conversation, it's about the enjoyment one going from the music. But again, I think we, we do need repertoire that we can go back to that, that makes us feel confident. Um, and I, I also believe that one should have difficult music in one's repertoire. Um, I mean, for me, the Ravel Tombeau de Couperin is my difficult repertoire at the moment. And I feel in some instances, in certain sections of it, I am at the limit of my abilities. Um, but that's also stretching me. It's improving my technique and my artistry. Um, and so I think we need those challenges as well. If we're always in the kind of middle road of, of the music that we feel most, repertoire we feel most comfortable with, I don't think we're going to progress. And especially for people like me who, who don't have a teacher who, who are, you know, learning and trying to improve um, without that support, you, you can do an awful lot, actually, by just giving yourself those challenges. Um, yes, I, I, I you know, certainly in my practice, um, I believe that one should have at least three. I, I'm a little bit more of a minimalist. I don't like to work on more than three pieces at mm. once. I mean, not counting the pieces you come back to that you're yeah, sure. your own time. But during a lesson, I believe there needs to be a piece that's you know at three different stages one yes you're being learned you know the other is well along and the third one um as you're saying just really um done and enjoyed and uh, also different periods are very very advisable mm. right you want to work on a classical i mean obviously this is a general rule you want to work on something classical something romantic mix up the styles not to get stuck in one favorite composer yes. Of course, again, if you're the person for whom it's absolutely necessary to just be playing Chopin, so <laughs> be it. Um, but if you really want to become a better pianist, it's important to learn how to play um, other composers as well. Definitely, um, yeah. Um, and uh, also, just as far as levels, coming back to a piece um, under supervision is very important because, you know, again, going back to concert pianists, um, as I said, and again, I'll use the example of my teacher, Mr. Feltzman. Uh, I played the Mephisto Waltz for him once, and he listened to me and he said, you know, it's a pretty nice piece. Yeah, I never learned it. Uh, and I was like, well, it's not too late. And he said, no, I, I don't learn new pieces anymore. <laughs> but but um, he didn't, I mean, I'm sure he was exaggerating. But the point is that you learn the repertoire and then you just play, you know, the Rachmaninoff's mm -hmm. 
the 200 times, but every time you play it, you become that much more confident and better at it. You know, yes. As far as the confidence and memorizing, backtracking to what we're talking about, um, play a piece at a recital at a meetup or at your own recording, that already brings you about 10% of the work up because there's a certain- Oh, definitely. Okay, I yeah. played it. I know what my weak spots are. Mm. The next time it grows as well. Um, yeah. So it's important yeah. to repeat. And, you know, in March of 2020, for example, I mm. found myself a little more anxious than usual. Mm -hmm. I'd come back with the groceries and I'd need to wipe everything down. <laughs> But you know, it's, it's funny, but it was really probably the mm -hmm. most anxious I've felt about yep. mundane activities ever. So I know that if I sit down to play, I'm going to calm down, mm -hmm. right? But I'm not going to sit down and play a piece that I I'm still learning. I'm going to sit down and play something yeah. that's my comfort piece, like you said. Yeah. It yeah. will lower the blood pressure, it will slow your breathing. and that's a very important uh, role of our playing at home as mm. actors or professionals or, or young students or anything in that spectrum is to use this particular pastime as mm. studying internally, balancing enjoyable activity that brings all so many functions uh, yeah. to synchronized um, play and just kind of makes you feel whole and you know calm yeah it's That's true but recordings i think have a have a use um and i find recordings quite helpful um when i'm trying to um learn a new work um and it was in fact a new recording of Ravel piano music that got me onto the tombeau de couperin although it's a piece i know um it was a particular recording it there's just something about it that that really appealed to me. So uh, while recordings can be very useful yeah. and inspirational, I think we have to be very careful not to try and copy. Yeah. So you yeah. can Andra Schiff playing Bach. Um, I don't think anyone <laughs> should attempt to imitate or emulate Andra Schiff because he has a distinct and personal playing style and sound. Um, and I think there is a danger that some people think that um, they can imitate um, when yeah. they yeah. listen to recordings. And unfortunately then, the, the, the resulting playing, their own playing can sound contrived and artificial. So I, I, what I often say to people about listening to recordings is yes, by all means, listen to recordings. I think I had 30 versions of Schubert's penultimate piano sonata, which formed the bulk of my fellowship diploma program on Spotify from um, very early recordings by Sher Cassidy to, um, you know, a recording that was four or five years ago. And each one offered me food for thought. Um, for example, there was one where the finale had some very interesting and very clear articulation, which I really liked, but they were really there to give me ideas and to help me formulate my own interpretation of that music. There wasn't a point where I thought, right, I'm going to copy how Murray Pariah does it. No, I, don't, I think it's very dangerous to do that. And I think there should also come a point where one says, right, I'm, I'm not actually going to listen to those recordings any longer. I'm setting out to, to form my own, in, my own interpretation of this piece now. Um, but they, they definitely have a role, and I think they can also be extremely inspiring. Yes, and along along these lines, uh, more um, in uh, connection with inspiration, you mentioned Ravel, um, who was, of course, as any music student knows, the master orchestrator. So mm. Ravel uh, exists in the orchestral version. Yes. So do a lot of pieces, pictures. I mean, I'm not going to start the litany of pieces, but the point I would like to make is that it's crucial to listen to orchestral recordings and yeah. instrumental recordings, which will help you find your own inspiration. Mm -hmm. Again, um, I can't tell you how many adult students were surprised when I asked them as homework, as they're studying a Beethoven sonatas, to go and listen to the Beethoven symphonies. Yeah, so yeah. Something that uh, 
the Russians tell you when you're six. You know, you, you have to approach any classical piano sonata as an orchestral work. Mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. how can you, unless you listen to the symphonies? How can oh, you play yes, yes. sonatas without listening to Fish, Fisher Discal? Um, yeah. Unthinkable. I mean, that's what I think. But um, a, a lot of amateurs or perhaps people who are self-taught as you're saying, are busy listening to piano record mm. and getting ideas from them. Whereas, you know, the piano is an orchestra. And mm -hmm. one of my things, which is why I've been transcribing things for a long time, is because I want to be able to play something. Because yeah. And I'm a pianist, so I want to yeah. play the piano. So we need an orchestral recording mm -hmm. to understand how a certain melody will sound or should sound mm. to imitate the flute or to imitate yeah. a violin or you know or a, or a timpani i would like to play my rendition of something from one of Bach's cantatas which literally involves a prelude to a piece where there's only the flute which in this case is the right hand and two accompanying oboes which are in the left hand and there's no nothing subtracted nothing added just being played on the piano exactly as Bach wrote it mm -hmm. No, I, I think that what you've just said is is really important, and and I think the other thing that that's that one gains from I call it listening around the repertoire. So yes, in addition to my thirty recordings of Schubert's B nine five nine, I had a number of the symphonies, uh, some of the oh. string quartets, piano trios, also works by Beethoven, which which connected to that sonata. Um, it gives you context as well. It sets the those pieces within the broader context of that composer's output. And I think that also, uh, and for me, this was really important because this piece was going to be, you know, heavily scrutinized by examiners as opposed to performed in concert. Um, I, I wanted to demonstrate that I had kind of fully assimilated that composer's sound world, not just his piano sound world, but like you say, the leader, I listened to a lot of leader, um, there's a, a particular movement of Winterizer, which is very closely connected to the, the Andantino of the D959. Those kinds of points of reference were very, very useful in allowing me to shape the music in the way I, I envisioned it. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that often teachers, you know, good, good teachers know to encourage their students to do this kind of thing. I used to send my teenage students playlists they like to have them on YouTube actually so they could see the pianist playing yeah. and I would send them a little playlist of of pieces that related to the music that they were learning and and they many of them found that very helpful but also quite inspiring um and you know unfortunately in in certainly in the UK education system the teaching of music is is too broad um and um it doesn't it, it sort of skims the surface um, so they don't get enough context um, and I think that you know they they don't realize that that um, certain composer might have written any number of other things for combinations of instruments or orchestra yeah. um, and then you know the moment of discovery is actually really exciting and wonderful yes so I'm really happy that we covered that particular aspect because um, you know, I wish we had six more hours because <laughs> really you are so active and in so many roles, um, you know, as um, 
the Meet the Artist series, for example, is just so helpful to a lot of people, including mm. myself. I was, you know, yes, I had the pleasure of, of uh, doing a, an interview two years ago with that. But it's so important and, and self revelatory to have somebody ask you questions about mm. what is your musical personality? What do you like to do? So you, you, you play so many roles. Uh, and oh, thank you. Thank you. Together. You're the hub of it. Uh, <laughs> has to do with the piano so it's been really a pleasure and um, I don't know maybe someday we'll do a, another one because I, yeah. I there's so much that resonates in me with everything that you say yet our experiences are so different so mm. I really think we complement each other oh I yes I with an e although I'm you know <laughs> it's really been a pleasure and um, I really look forward to many more exchanges and uh, you know, you're wonderfully helpful to a lot of people in social media oh, well. and your blog. So, so thank you so much. For well, th thank you, Eleanor, for inviting me to do this. And, and I would like to echo everything that you've said. Um, and I, I just like to say that, you know, everything I do, um, which, as I said earlier, stems from my blog and my you know, activities online, it, it really does come from my own passion for the piano. I know that sounds a bit cliche, but it's true. And I, I adore it. And I felt very sad um, and unsettled in March, as you mentioned. We, we know why, for the same reasons. And I actually couldn't play the piano for weeks and weeks. I hardly touched it. And I kind of felt that I was missing a companion. But I, I know that it was because I was feeling anxious. Um, and now com having committed myself to learn some new music and to practice regularly again, I just feel sort of, it's like I said before, I feel I've come home again. I found my level. Um, so it, yeah, <laughs> well, it's, 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 my, it's my special thing, my special place, the piano. Well, um, I hear you and it's a little bit corny of me to say what I'm going to say, but what I've been busying myself with for the past three, four, five years was really stemming from a sincere wish to make something fabulous and not mm -hmm. stressful available to, to many pianists, hopefully around the world, who would benefit from that type of music. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you for you know, being on my side and mm -hmm. caring about the amateur pianist and the piano yourself and, and helping us maybe help them by by some observations or, or ideas that perhaps will strike you know ring a bell or strike a, a chord to use music mm -hmm. <laughs> allergies and people so i really really appreciate this and well thank you thank you i look forward to many many more yes questions. And yes and well if you're ever in in the uk eleanor we must meet in person we will i, I will <laughs>